Well, I'm going to talk today about Gabriele D'Annunzio, who was the subject of my most recent book. And I promise it's not that I've misunderstood the brief. I know that this isn't the kind of festival where authors arrive in order to plug their own books and boost their own reputations. Uh, we're not here for purposes of self-promotion, but to step back from that process and reflect upon it. Um, but D'Annunzio is going to be my way into that subject. He was born in 1863, died 1938, but all the same, he had a very sophisticated and prescient understanding of the way in which literary reputation is created in the modern world. Donuzio had the highest possible ambitions for his work. He described himself as the greatest Italian author since Dante. <laughs> he was never shy about blowing his own trumpet. He was erudite, he was immensely well read in half a dozen languages, ancient and modern. He was an intellectual polymath who interested himself in everything from Baroque music to Hindu mysticism to the design of aeroplanes. And yes, he was very well aware that in that he resembled Leonardo da Vinci, another great Italian with whom he liked to associate himself. But for all that, he was never too highbrow to consider the commercial side of the book business. He was an absolute genius in the art of self-promotion. He once wrote to his publisher that he was delighted with the publisher because you really know how to push a book. And when a friend of his started up a literary magazine, D'Annunzio advised him to pay more attention to publicity. Why don't you hustle your review, he said. He used the English word hustle. And he went on, take an example from Tot. Tot was a remedy for indigestion. And Tot had a very high profile advertising campaign. Now, one of the reasons that D'Annunzio seemed to me an excellent subject for a biography was that he had such a keen sense of the zeitgeist that to write about him was to write about his age. And he was fully aware that the modern era was going to be an age of advertising and of publicity and of marketing, of hustle, in other words. Um, it's significant that the protagonist of one of the first masterpieces of literary modernism, James Joyce's Leopold Bloom, makes his living by selling advertising. So, to introduce Donuts here briefly to those of you who don't know him, um, his work isn't well known outside of Italy part now, um, partly because it is very hard to translate, and that's something I know we're all going to be talking about a lot this week. Um, but in his day, he was an internationally acclaimed poet, novelist, and playwright. He was much admired by his peers, by his Italian contemporaries, but by others as well. Henry James wrote about him repeatedly and hailed him as another master like himself. And even Ernest Hemingway, who absolutely detested D'Annunzio personally, conceded that you had to admire him for the beauty of his writing, even though he was, in Hemingway's words, such a jerk. D'Annunzio was also a phenomenally successful serial seducer, rather surprisingly, since he was a rather a sort of funny-looking little fellow. But he had a very busy love life, which kept the gossip columnists busy for several decades and his life had a political dimension. He was a passionately committed nationalist, an elitist, a militarist, and a warmonger, believing that what Italy needed was a baptism of blood, as he called it. He was instrumental in bringing Italy into World War I. And a generation older than Mussolini, he came up with many of the ideas and also the political strategies and practices which would become commonplace under fascism. So, D'Annunzio published his first book in 1880. It was a time when literacy rates were rising and printing costs were falling, both at an exponential rate. 
new journals were springing up all over the new nation of Italy, which was then only 10 years old. The technology of printing was progressing by leaps and bounds. Uh, later on, when D'Annunzio was at the peak of his success, one of his speeches was published across the entire front page of the Corriere della Sera, and D'Annunzio asked to be allowed to visit the print works to see his words being, as it were, spilled out. And he wrote about the thrill of watching his words flowing off the paper's brand new printing presses. 300,000 copies, which may not sound very much in today's terms, but that was in the very early years of the 20th century, huge number. So 300,000 copies of his words to be distributed across Italy that very day. He was intensely excited by this. He was acutely aware of and interested in the fact that he lived at the beginning of the age of the mass media. He became a celebrity and he thought and wrote a great deal about what that meant. So in his reclusive old age, he was to write about the horror of being Gabriele D'Annunzio. He was fully aware that his public persona was an artificial construct. Uh, he was partly aware because he was one of the people who'd been constructing it. Um, and that persona had a separate existence from that of the human being himself. He used to talk about commissioning a life-size waxwork of himself, and he said he would like to seat it in a window overlooking Venice's Grand Canal so that the gondoliers could point it out to tourists. <laughs> um, like many celebrities, he longed, sometimes anyway, to be able to separate himself from his own celebrity. But instead, all he did was to have a forbiddingly high wall built around his garden, while profiting by his fame to lure star-struck young women into his lair. A character in his first novel, Pleasure, tells the young hero, you must make your life as you make a work of art. D'Annunzio was an aesthete. He was of the same generation as Oscar Wilde and Huismans, whose Araboa directly inspired pleasure. The idea of life as an artwork is, anyway, partly an aesthetic one. D'Annunzio did aspire to live beautifully. When he was waiting for a woman, he would set out expensive china tea. China tea was new to Europe at the time and crystallised violets all set out on little silver saucers. He filled his rooms with lilies, he burnt incense, he scattered rose petals over his bed when he was hoping to get a woman into it. Um, so he, you know, he liked to live the life beautiful, as Oscar Wilde would have called it. And Donuzio devoted the last 18 years of his life to transforming his beautifully sighted but originally otherwise unremarkable house on the hills above Lake Garda into an extraordinary piece of installation art. It's still there and open to the public and I think at least one of you has said you'd seen it. Um, it's every room and every part of its garden was and is devoted to the celebration and commemoration of himself. Rooms are cluttered with bibelot and with weapons and with sexual trophies, he liked to steal a glove from every woman he bedded. And they're all kept in one particular room. Um, the garden ornaments include half of a real warship, which is, its rear is embedded into the hillside, the front sort of cantilevered out, so it appears about to sort of sail off into the sky above the lake. Um, this was a, a present from, from Mussolini to Donuzio, who sent it complete with a set of real live sailors. And uh, Donuzio took pleasure in drilling them on deck. But this was all a kind of, as it were, an homage to his own wartime exploits when he would often go out on warships. And the whole house and its, its sort of domain is, as I say, designed as a kind of artwork, come mausoleum, um, and D'Annunzio once said, I am a better interior decorator than I am a poet. Uh, he wasn't being self-deprecating, he was never self-deprecating. To him, clothes, 
furniture and the decoration of a room were serious matters. But his art of life making was about much more than damask cushions and stained glass. Life wasn't something that happened to him, it was something that he worked on. Um, long before he had two sticks of furniture to rub together, he was building up his own reputation and shaping his life story into a legend. In old age, looking back on his career, he explained how he had come to be known as the poet, as though you know, there was only one in the whole country, and also as a national hero. He said, I knew how to give my actions the lasting power of the symbol. He began young. He published his first volume when he was um, 16 years old, still at boarding school. Um, it was very well received, really astonishingly well received for a book by such a very young author. But that wasn't nearly enough for Denuncio. Uh, you know, he didn't want just the respect of book reviewers, he wanted to be a properly front-page famous person. So a few months later, when his next volume was ready for publication, he was a fantastically fast worker, he sent an anonymous telegram to the editor of a journal in Florence, informing the editor of the tragic death in a riding accident of that brilliant young prodigy that great poet in the making, Gabriele D'Annunzio. The editor was taken in, ran the story. It was picked up and repeated by other <coughs> journals all across Italy. Uh, the story ran day after day after day. What might this marvelous boy have done if only he'd been granted more time? What a terrible loss to Italian literature. Condolences to his sorrowing family, so on and so forth. And D'Annunzio sat on his hands for nearly a week. And then just as the story was, as it were, running out of steam, he sent a second telegram, signing it this time, to the same Florentine editor, reproaching the man for having caused such terrible distress to himself and his family, uh, but saying that after careful consideration, he had magnanimously decided that he wasn't going to sue. Um, it worked. When, a year or two later, D'Annunzio left school, took himself off to Rome, he arrived there at the age of 18, already a famous poet. So that was his first publicity stunt. And there were to be many, many more. At the age of 20, D'Annunzio eloped with the daughter of the Duke di Galesi. Um, but before eloping, he informed all his friends in the press. So the young couple secretly got on the train in Rome. When they arrived in Florence, they were met on the platform by a, a crowd of reporters. A few days later, D'Annunzio's poem, in which he describes in really quite startlingly graphic detail how he had initially seduced his young wife in a bluebell wood, was published and, of course, attracted a great deal more attention than it would have done had it not coincided with a sort of social scandal. And he was to repeat that or similar kinds of tricks over and over again. Twice, with a novel about to come out, D'Annunzio fought duels with close friends. Dueling was illegal, but it was considered dashing and glamorous. And in each case, funny enough, no one was hurt, but in each case, the duel ensured that D'Annunzio's name was in the papers, just as his book appeared in the shops. He wanted fame. He was also interested in it as a phenomenon. He played with the idea of fame. His first novel, Pleasure, came out when he was 25. Its hero is a young aristocrat and artist called Count Andrea Sperelli. In the novel, the fictional Sparelli makes an etching of his mistress lying asleep on a marvellous blue silk bedspread embroidered with all the signs of the zodiac. In reality, D'Annunzio commissioned his friend, an artist, to produce a picture exactly as described in the novel, adding the titillating detail 
that as the woman lies, her upper body partially exposed, a greyhound leads, leans over to lick her naked breast. Denuncio had been at great pains to, um, to um, refuse any suggestion that his novel was in any way pornographic, but he was perfectly happy to use sort of titillating erotic in a, imagery in promoting it. And so the real-life artist, Denuncio's friend, entering into the spirit of the thing, signed it not with his own name, but with that of the fictional Andrea Sperelli. Denuncio said, we'll sell it with an air of mystery. The etching went on display in the front window of a fashionable picture dealer's shop on the Corso, and a limited edition of prints were sold at high prices. So Donuzio was living in the pre-modernist era, but this was a cheekily post-modernist move. Art was imitating art and trespassing into the real world. A real picture by a fictional person was generating real money and further publicity for Donuzio. Um, in Donuzio's lifetime, Nietzsche declared the death of God. Donuzio greatly admired Nietzsche, and, and therefore Donuzio was also present at God's deathbed. And the decline of religious faith left a moral vacuum, of course. Why strive to be good if there's no God to please? But more interestingly to Donuzio, it also left a vacancy in the public's emotional life. Who was there to worship? Donuzio used to see the aged composer and virtuoso pianist Franz Liszt sitting in the audience at concerts in Rome in the 1880s. Four decades previously, Europe had been swept by Listomania. Liszt was a great star in his time. Now, even in his old age, Donuzio noticed Liszt was still worshipped as an idol. His adorers gazed at him, wrote Donuzio, in a kind of religious ecstasy, as devotees might gaze when the priest elevates the host. As his own reputation grew, Donuzio himself became the object of that kind of quasi-religious veneration. He was an unbeliever, but he learnt a great deal from the church's rituals and liturgy. Increasingly, over the decades, his public appearance came to be staged like sacred ceremonies. And he adopted a kind of priestly rhetoric, first in his sort of uh, appearances at kind of literary gatherings and subsequently in his political speeches, uh, staging his, his speeches as a sequence of call and response, question and answer, very much as the priest will call out to a congregation in a church service. So literary reputation, as Donuzio perceived, could be transmuted into a, a kind, a quasi-religious worship of a celebrity. But it also has an erotic charge. Donuzio Riley observed that neither the strength of Hercules nor the beauty of Hippolytus has as great a power to thrill a woman as does fame. He was a star from very early on and he had his groupies and very much enjoyed that. He profited by the sexual opportunities his fame brought him, but he thought about it as well, writing that it must be sweet for a woman to be able to think that she possessed, at least temporarily, someone whose work made hundreds of others, as he put it, swoon with passion. And when in his 30s he embarked on his most famous love affair with the great actress Eleonora Duza, he experienced that phenomenon from the other side. And he was to write, when the theatre echoes with applause and flames with desire, he upon whom alone the diva gazes, upon whom she smiles, is intoxicated by pride. He also naturally made use of their relationship to boost his own career. Like Miller and Monroe, they were a, a celebrity couple, immensely famous, and you know, each one's fame augmented the fame of the other. Um, and of 
more practically, with Duza producing and performing in his plays, D'Annunzio was assured an absolutely vast audience. Uh, another aspect of his growing reputation, one which has already been talked about here, um, was the, f the, uh, the, f the question of being famous in the right place. D'Annunzio himself didn't take much note of this, perhaps because he didn't like to acknowledge the element of chance in the gradual growth of his, his reputation. He liked to see himself as being the creator of his own greatness. But it was very important for him that in 1890, when D'Annunzio was living in Naples, a French school teacher called Georges Herel visited the city. Herel read and enjoyed a Neapolitan journal, and when he left to return to France, he took out a postal subscription to it. When D'Annunzio's novel, The Innocent, began to appear in this journal in serial form, Herel was, he says, dazzled. So he wrote to D'Annunzio and asked permission to translate it. D'Annunzio was delighted. Uh, when Herel's version was published in Paris in 1892, it was a tremendous success. Sales were, tr were prodigious. And it was not only you know, a bestseller, it was also a sort of succès d'estime. And D'Annunzio's new French admirers organized a conference at the Sorbonne to discuss and celebrate his work. So uh, this is a, an instance of a topic which, which Deborah was talking about and which will, I'm sure, be talked about over and over again this week, that uh, you know, there are certain places and where reputation is made, and John was talking about that too. And in the 1890s, Paris was one of those places, possibly the one, although you know, in this country we like to think that London was equally important. But in the 1890s, Paris really was the Western world sort of intellectual entrepôt. Everything passed through France. And it was through reading and imitating French authors that D'Annunzio had made himself into a writer. And it was in French translations he had discovered the Russian novelists. I mean, he was to write a novel which is sort of direct pastiche of Tolstoy and another which is a direct pastiche of Dostoevsky, but he only knew those authors' works in French. And it was in French that he first read Nietzsche. It was in, it, and it was from reading Parisian journals that he picked up on the fashion for Japanese art, which he then um, you know, diffused in Italy. So it was terrifically important to him to be known in Paris. The Italian publishing ind industry was still small. The Italian fictional tradition was slim. Had Erel not visited Naples, D'Annunzio's international reputation would have grown much more slowly. As it was after the su success in France of the French translation of The Innocent, Erel translated D'Annunzio's other novels as well. German and English publishers took note, commissioned their own translations in turn, and so D'Annunzio achieved international recognition. And then, uh, this is a, ph a phenomenon that's also been mentioned here, the more admired he was abroad, the more Italians who'd initially been slow to kind of fall over themselves to buy his books, the more, as they saw, he was becoming a bestseller abroad, the bigger his reputation at home became. And I've said how much he wanted that recognition and that fame. Um, he once wrote of one of his fictional characters, a writer, that he was drawn to his public as a predatory bird is drawn to its prey. Mm -hmm. And uh, he could have been describing himself. Um, he continued to write poetry all his life, but he quickly realized that he could never reach the huge readership he wanted by means of poetry. So, you know, he switched routes. He took up journalism, writing reams and reams of diary pieces and gossip columns, as well as reviews of art and literature. Um, you know, he, he had no shame in that way. He wasn't embarrassed about writing popular journalism. And when his highbrow friends expressed their distaste for the press and said, you know, how can you, how can you dirty your fingers with that kind of writing? Um, he, he said that an idea planted in, a, planted in a magazine 
would germinate and sprout far more quickly than one planted in a book. He moved on from journalism to writing fiction because he'd noticed that the journals to which he was contributing would sell phenomenally well if they were publishing a serialized novel. Fiction was what the public wanted. The public wanted. And then later, when he switched to playwriting, he was once more following the crowd. I mean, nowadays, we, we tend to think of theatre as entertainment for the middle classes. But in late 19th century Italy, it was a genuinely popular art form. Every small town had a theatre and everyone went to it. So in writing plays, Denunzio, for the first time, could speak to the illiterate. And his first nights were riotous, literally. Uh, there, there were demonstrations outside the theatres where his more politically provocative works were playing. They were also grand. Royalty attended his premieres. So he was, you know, his reach was now spanning all society from the very top right down to the, the common man and woman. And, um, you know, he wasn't going to stop there living in Paris in the last years before the First World War. He got involved with the brand new form of cinema, being one of the very first of his intellectual peers to do so. He wrote the intertitles for a silent epic called Cabiria, and he was paid so much money for this, this task, which took him just under three days, that um, he and his secretary little, literally couldn't believe their ears when the offer was made. There's an exchange of letters between them in which Donald is saying to his secretary, do you really think they meant thousands? Or well, maybe it was hundreds. Anyway, um, again, you know, cinema at that time, it was a popular art form. You know, very few serious writers would have wanted to get involved, but Donuzio was always wanting to put himself out there to reach as many people as he possibly could. And this restless pursuit of an ever growing public wasn't motivated only by financial greed and Danuzio's hunger for attention and praise. Certainly he did want fame and prestige and he was very pleased when those intangible things could be transformed into money. Uh, a hotel keeper once decided not to bank the cheque with which Danuzio had paid his bill. Uh, declaring that Donuzio's autograph was worth more to him than the money it represented. Uh, Donuzio was delighted by this story and told his secretary to broadcast it far and wide in the hope that the many, many tradesmen to whom he was in debt might make the same choice. But uh, for all that, he, he wasn't cynical. Um, his main motive for seeking to reach more people was that he really cared about the political message that he had to deliver. Um, he was a fervent nationalist from childhood. Aged 13, he wrote that his mission was to teach the people to love their country and to hate the enemies of Italy to the death. Becoming a poet, he saw himself as the voice of the new nation. In his early years, he wrote love poetry or lyrical descriptions of nature or neo-pagan fantasies about fauns and centaurs. But even then, he saw his writing, however apolitical it might appear, as being a patriotic service that he was performing for Italy. He was creating a new great literature for the new great Italy. And John was talking earlier about the need for a nation mm. to have a culture which was sort of commensurate with its status in the world. And, and then when he went on, began to write um, slightly more overtly political work, when he wrote in celebration of the glories of Renaissance art or the beauty of the Tuscan landscape, he was developing a backstory for the new nation of which he considered himself to be the prime voice. His plays especially celebrate heroic masculinity. Nietzschean supermen fight in African wars or build ships to conquer Italy's enemies in the Adriatic. History is set to serve propaganda. 
the might and grandeur of the ancient Roman Empire or the medieval Venetian Empire are glorified as models for the new expansionist greater Italy. But uh, Donuzio's reputation was not just a launch pad from which he could fire off his political ideas, it was itself a weapon. When, in May 1915, Italy entered the Great War on the side of France and England, uh, Donuzio was overjoyed. Initially, the military command tried to keep him away from the action. If Donuzio was killed, they thought the loss of such a famous Italian would be a dreadful blow to national morale. He was outraged. Uh, he saw himself as a, a great, uh, the voice of the war, he said. He must be allowed to take part in it. He used all his contacts, up to and including the Prime Minister, to get himself an active role. And finally, he was appointed liaison officer with the freedom to do pretty much whatever he pleased. He became an orator, uh, roaring up and down the battle lines in his big shiny car. Um, he harangued troops going into battle. He delivered eulogies at the grim mass burials when battle was over. Every one of his contemporaries who heard him speak, including those who detested him, agree that he was a spellbinding orator. General Diaz, who was the Italian commander-in-chief during the latter part of the war, once said that a battle before which Danuzio had addressed the troops was already three quarters won. Now, Danunzio's notebooks for the war years show how observant he was of the reality of war. He records all the ghastly details of trench warfare. But in his speeches, when he was speaking publicly, and all his speeches were promptly published in pamphlet form and distributed to the troops and to those back home, in them he doesn't describe the reality of conflict. He elaborates an inspirational vision of war as a great foundry in which the nation is being forged. He talks of how men from all over the Italian peninsula, people whose differing dialects made it impossible for them even to converse with one another, were being brought together in the purifying fire of suffering to create, he says, a wonder, a secular miracle, the birth of a great country. And the uneducated teenage conscripts to whom Donizio was speaking, as even he conceded, didn't probably quite follow what he was saying, but they were moved by his presence among them. His status as a great man, a famous person, made him a kind of a totem of the war. Uh, once when he was visiting the trenches, a shell exploded very close to where he was standing, killing some dozen men. And the soldier standing next to him said, they can be spared, but if you died, where would we find such another? So he was worshipped, um, but he was also hated. When a group of soldiers mutinied, refusing to go back to the front line, they chanted, kill Danunzio, kill Danunzio, as they opened fire on their officers. To them, as to his admirers, the fame Danunzio had won as an author made him the embodiment of Italian militarism. He was a speaker, he was also an aviator. Um, he would take off from Venice in the tiny, flimsy little aeroplanes of the time, flying over Trieste and other Austrian-occupied ports. He and his, um, his pilot, he never actually learned to fly the planes himself, he would fly as second man and bombardier. They would drop bombs on Austrian ships in the harbours and over the city centres he dropped pamphlets written by himself calling upon the populations to rise up against their Austrian masters. His writing had become a martial art. He enjoyed the war tremendously and with it over he wasn't quite sure what to do with himself but then he found a new way of making use of his literary reputation. In 1919, he transmuted his fame as a poet into political power. He made himself dictator of the disputed Croatian city of Fiume, now called Rijeka. 
Uh, thousands of volunteers arrived from all over Europe to join what he called his legion. By this time, he was presenting himself as a latter-day Julius Caesar. Um, those volunteers' motives for joining him were mixed. Many of them were ex-soldiers, um, they were militarists addicted to danger, unwilling to settle for the complexity of civilian life. But many more were drawn by the idea that in Fiume they would be, as one of them wrote, living in poetry. Osbert Sitwell visited the city and reports that the train that took him there was crammed with teenage stowaways with volumes of Denuncio's poetry in their pockets. And um, his, his adventure over, you know, he was, Denuncio was driven out of Fiume after 16 months and he withdrew to Lake Garda to his house there to devote the rest of himself, to, uh, of his life to uh, serving his cocaine habit to doing up his house and to cashing in on his literary re reputation by repeatedly rewriting and republishing his own work. And meanwhile, as he withdrew from public life, Mussolini succeeded him as the front man of the Italian nationalist right. D'Annunzio never publicly endorsed the fascists. He saw them as vulgar, brutal imitators of the great man himself. But if D'Annunzio was not exactly a fascist, fascism was certainly D'Annunzian. And he wrote to Mussolini saying, is not all that is best about fascism taken from me? When I began researching my book about him, the first thing I did was to read a number of the early biographies. And repeatedly I came across one or other of two linked arguments. One was that D'Annunzio couldn't really be a great writer because his politics were so obnoxious. And the other, which is really just the converse, was that his poetry is so beautiful that he can't really have held those obnoxious opinions. And you know, I take issue with both those arguments. It seems to me you can perfectly well uh, be at once a great artist and yet hold opinions with which probably no one in this room would agree. Um, so I was going to conclude by asking two questions which actually Chris has already asked, but I'm going to ask them again because why not? And the first is, what, um, to quote the title of an essay of Denuncia's, we might call the Wagner question. Um, can we respect an artist whose politics we deplore? And the second is, can literary reputation be a screen behind which deplorable ideas can be smuggled into our minds?